Well, I've looked forward to this for a while. I just uh, didn't know long, how long it'd take Jeff to go away so I could get something, some opportunity. Uh, no, I didn't say it that way. I said it that way. I didn't mean it that way. Um, what a blessing. What a privilege. Talk to Jeff about it every day. Just, uh, I guess he's worried, you know, that I'd do this and show up. Um, I did call Dana about, I don't know, 5.30. It's time for supper. And I'm sitting in a traffic jam at airport going down to Parkway. Anybody else see that? What a wonderful time, wasn't it? Wonderful time, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was not a wonderful time. But, uh, of course, that wasn't near as bad as, as some of you football fans had this afternoon, was it? I see pouting going on, and I saw two jump off a bridge between here and... <laughs> well, we lost Coach Bowden several years ago, so I know your pain. And... Uh, Hope you don't go through the mess we went through to get to Mike Norvell. We'll see what happens with football. We're going to talk tonight about uh, not um, looking into idols. So I won't even mention what football and that has to do with anything. Um, seems like in the fall, if you're not a hunter and you're not a football player, you come to church. <laughs> no, y'all show up real regular either way, but a lot of people put God on the sidelines and or not sideline, but in the back pocket maybe, and then go off and do something besides church in the fall. My brother was a, was a hunter for a long time, and he, he chased deer more than he chased Jesus in the fall. Anybody know anybody like that? This means yes. This means no. This means I care less, Rob. I don't want to see any of that tonight, so let's don't go there. I want to talk to you about a couple things tonight that I, I think will be interesting. Um, The topic may be odd to you, but it's what God struck me with in some of the translations and studies that I uh, roused about in the last six weeks. Uh, I know you're going to be embarrassed now that I've tried six weeks to prepare this little sucker that um, it's not going to be any better than it is, but y'all hang in there. It's going to be all right. So I do want to talk to you about uh, what we need to know and the confidence in prayer and knowing is is the thing. But this is written that you may know and that the... uh, Confidence is the key to knowing. Um, I think I want to start off with uh, just a comment before we read. And um, well, let's read the Bible. Let's do that. Figure out how I want to do this. Y'all look with me, if you would, to First John. It's just a couple of pages ahead of Revelation. Everybody. First John chapter 5, but you can read it. Read it on the board if you want to. That's perfectly fine. We're going to read this out of the New King James. And then I'm going to pick it apart. Um, I did enough seminary to know that the King James wasn't ideal. And, and this is really going to show you some of the why tonight. Nothing wrong with the Bible itself, God's inerrant word, but he didn't write the King James like, uh, anyway, we'll leave that. I'm not going to tear that beast up tonight. If you would, start with me in verse 13 and just listen along as I read out of my morning study Bible so I don't have any problems with King James. Starting in verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, watch how many times that word crops up during this passage, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence, there's that word, that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. This is fun. Listen, listen very careful to this one. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and God will give him life for those who, have, those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death, and then he clarifies. I do not say that he should pray about that. And of course, all unrighteousness is sin. And there is sin not leading to death. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. That's pretty provocative. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Good closing here. Listen good. This is the best. This is the home run of the whole ball game. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true. 
And we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And there's that idle part. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen? Amen. Amen. A lot of little catchy stuff in here. And I read it and studied it for about two weeks in this scenario with a lot of commentaries. And I couldn't decide where to go. I was really provoked by, you know, things like if you ask for it, you get it. Um, that really hard thing about sin unto death. And then the last, the third portion, if you will, you know, if you, if you know God and you're born of God, you don't sin. Anybody not sin today? How can I get a quick handshake? Anybody not sin the last week? <laughs> Gary's right. Gary's very right. Um, those things can stir you up. But I, I, I learned um, the best way to study the Bible as opposed to what I did for two weeks, which is chase commentaries all over creation, is to find different versions of the Bible. Anybody ever heard of George Mueller? Good guy, right? Top, of the, top shelf, right, Dana? Carl's waving his hand, some John Outlaw. Yeah, a lot of y'all, the George Mueller. Uh, built one orphanage after another and was not a man of means and never asked anybody for money. And the, and the thousands and maybe millions back in that day, thousands was a lot, 18, 1800s, um, just built one over after another because God provided, God provided, God kept providing. And me and Carl talk about God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he owns the hills under them cattle and he owns the taters in them hills. And if God wants to sell taters, cattle, or hills anytime he wants to pay y'all's bills, our bills, the bills of the church, he'll never call you to do something that he won't pay for. So that was worthy of a bunch of amens right there. I don't know who, who heard that, but it's very key. And so Mueller said his study, he didn't trust men's commentary. He wanted to open six or seven language writings of the Bible. They didn't have NASB and New King James and NIV. You know what I call the NIV, right? Nearly inspired version. Y'all ever heard of that one? The uh, uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible. Y'all know that one? That's hardcore Southern Baptist. It's, it's the letters fit, trust me. Um, and I are one, so I can pick on me. But, but I don't know six or eight languages. I don't know two well enough to study the Bible in two languages. But I do have a half a dozen good translations at my house. And now we've gotten more translations than you can shake a stick at. So my best word from seminary in hermeneutics class, hermeneutics, fancy word for art of interpretation, was Dr. Lemke always said, Dr. Grant Lovejoy, said, if you, if you don't understand something, keep reading. Two words, keep reading. <laughs> Go back and read it again. Read the chapter before it, the chapter after it. Liz read the whole book of 1 John this afternoon. Letter, you know, it's not a, not a biggie, but an hour, less than an hour. And that's the key. And then balance that with other writings. Balance John's writings with Paul's writings. Balance Paul's writings with the apostles. The three, the four, and what John is one of the apostles, uh, the four apostles. But you can find the same topics, the same meaning, the same words, the same doctrines throughout Scripture. And if you don't see them correlating, you're not reading it right or you hadn't finished reading. Because the Bible's very harmonic. It, it's very true. It's very inerrant. It's infallible. It's uh, sufficient for all things unto man. It'll get you all the way to eternity. You know, I tell Gary, we talk, and Richard and Barbara have been friends of mine for 20 years. Uh, the nations are a new couple that we just dearly love. If I want to give you advice, whoopee. But, but my best advice may not get you around the block. This word of God will get you to eternity Amen. and beyond, whatever that looks like. And so that's what you need to know. My, my best friend in seminary was also my major professor, and he said, you know, pray scripture. If you want to pray something that's going to be asked upon, be, be, be acted upon is a better way, um, pray scripture. And so that's what you got to do. I want to do something 
um, that you're not going to expect. But instead of reading it in the New King James, I, I liked best the explanations that were attached. Do any of y'all have a copy of the Amplified Version? Rebecca, I'm not surprised. Anybody else? John? It's very good. It's, it's sound. It's built off the Greek and the Hebrew. It's done by good biblical scholars. It's not something to be afraid of. But it's a little longer, and it comes with inverse explanations sometimes. Not real changes, not commentary. You know, as I taught school for several years, and um, Sunday school particularly, the most arguments I ever came across were about the uninspired version at the top. I mean, at the bottom. You know, you got your bi- commentary. Everybody got, who's got a, commenta- uh, a Bible with commentary at the bottom? Probably all of us. Throw it away. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I mean, a Rowry study Bible is hard to beat. This is a MacArthur st- study Bible. Um, don't throw it away. But I'm saying, don't fuss about the part that's uninspired. Don't bicker about what one man says to another man about the scripture, let the Bible talk and then correlate that. I love a Bible like Nelson's New King James, which has just a center column of concordances, cross-references, some other verse that's related to what you just heard. And so that's a key to me to study. Um, Let me get on with this passage. I really don't, oh, I got 25, I'm fine. And uh, I got a whole page, so if I read it fast, we'd be in in five minutes. Shocked, right? Uh, (laughs) He doesn't believe me. And uh, he's probably, hey man, somebody has said, I love it. Michael, hush your mouth, boy. I used to try to teach and preach and and I wouldn't get any amens, Michael. And (laughs) And I said, if I could get a couple amens, we'd get out of here. And everybody, amen, amen, amen. I was like, oh man, that's not what I meant. Come on, that's not fair. Don't do that, don't do that. So... Okay, <clears throat> let's, let's start with the verse, first verse, and uh, I'll actually read verse three. Uh-oh, I already upset John. Golly, Dad, gum it. I knew, I knew it happened. I knew it would happen. Okay, I'm going to read 13 through um, 15 and talk about that just for a second. These things, that's a, that's a topic we're going to tear pieces, Okay. These things I have written to you who believe in them, and this is the Amplified Version, so look up, you won't, it won't follow. Well, stay with yours, it's okay. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, which represents all that Jesus Christ is and does, so that you will know with settled and absolute knowledge that you already have eternal life. This is the remarkable degree of confidence which we, as believers, are entitled to have. Before him, by him, through him. That if we ask anything according to his will, and his will is something that is consistent with his plan and his purpose, the promise is he hears us. It's not an automatic, I'm going to get what I want. It's a promise that he hears us. But it does say, and in fact we know for a fact, as indeed we do, that he hears and listens to us in whatever we ask, We also know with settled and absolute knowledge, like it said at the top, that we have granted to us the request which we have asked from him. It's a little longer. It's a little more wordy, but it's explanatory. That's why they call it amplified. You know what an amplifier is? That's what's making me hear y'all now. Is the slightest little ring in my ear my tinnitus, Lucas, or is it, do y'all hear it too? Y'all don't hear it. That's good. No? Okay. It's totally my tinnitus. We'll, We'll work with that. I got it, so I can't fuss about it. Uh, I choose not to. These things, you might ask, what do they mean? What's that all about? These things are written to us, to the Ephesian church, to the Asia Minor area. This, this letter to, uh, through John, by John, we believe, the Apostle John, was written to a group of churches in Asia Minor, Ephesus being the primary one. And, um, but it's also written to all believers, It's always good to know context. Who is it really speaking to? That means a lot because if it's Ephesus, that explains that last tack on verse, which we'll tackle in about 15 minutes. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. That's the weirdest close to a letter or a book. Barbara, thank you. I got another nod right here. Okay. But it's to Ephesus, and they're full of idols there, so it makes a little bit of sense, and we'll, we'll spell out what that little short sentence means in about a paragraph. 
These things I've written to you is the entire, the whole, the complete letter. If you've read all these things like my sister Liz did this afternoon, then what we're reading now makes more sense. And if you read it as a letter, uh, how many, John, I know, I'm, do we, were y'all in the military? How many of y'all were in the military? And, and did you ever write a letter to your girlfriend, wife? John did, okay. Gary said, hey, lots of times. I like that term, Gary. You're a pretty romantic guy. I knew that. I knew that. Um, if you wrote that to the wife or the girlfriend, John, would you expect her to read a quarter of it and lay it down for two weeks and come back two weeks later, read another sentence or two? And well, that's what we do. That's what we do. We, we read pieces, parts of the Bible and expect it to just uh, scream at us, explain itself, challenge us to do something, and then we go back and read a couple more sentences later. You know? And that's really what we're doing, even when we read just segments of 1 John, or just 1 John and not 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, because he wrote those kind of together. Anyway, it's how we do things. But that entire book, if you go back after we're done tonight, and we'll be done with the book before Jeff gets back home, it substantiates what we're fixing to say. What things, you might ask. I'm so glad. The entire epistle or letter speaks to us specifically. Anybody know what an epistle is, by the way? Anybody? A guess? A letter? No, the epistles are of the wives of the apostles, Carl. You didn't know that? No, that's not true. That's a joke. Y'all will get it on the way home. It's not that important. Yeah, the wives of the apostles. That's the epistles. But the real things that he wrote are things like this. This, these are, this is serious. Back to serious, sorry. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Son of God is his child. Obedience by faith and faith alone is the right answer. If we love him, we will obey him. What's the best way to, what's, a, what's one wonderful way to obey God? And don't say go to church. I mean, that's a decent thing. Sir? Follow his rules, obedience. What, what's a good way to obey him? Obey his commands. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about loving people? Would that fit into it? It was one of his, that's his primo command, isn't it? When, when Jesus was cornered in Matthew by the lawyer, Larry, and he literally looked him in the face and said, what's the best and greatest commandment of all? Which he really meant, what's the way to get to heaven? How do we do it? Some, some of those 10 up or those 600 that the Jews created and stirred up. Rules. Exactly. But the best way to obey God is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Is that just the person next to you, Barbara? Or is it the whole rest of the world? Two choices. <laughs> I know you love her a bunch and he's pretty close to second or you day-to-day choose, right? But the honest answer for neighbor is not your favorite people, but it's all people. It's all people. Amen. Salvation rests in the work of Christ. Amen? Not in our performance. Hello? Okay. Performance would mean good days, by golly, I feel saved. Bad days, well, not so sure. Michael, wake up, son. <laughs> we talk every morning. We talk every morning. I've, I've been reading his mail. I have, I have. I'll pick on you. You know that. I'm not picking on you in front of you, nobody but your friends. I mean, right? This is family. We can be honest. And I'm with you. You know this. We both fight the same demons. That's why God put us together. But good days I feel saved, and bad days I'm not so sure. That's a joke, isn't it, Miss Deb? That's not true. That's not, Drew, that's not biblically sound, is it? Amen. All right, you're on the same page as I am. The whole letter speaks of the conscious knowledge of eternal life. Go back and read just five little chapters. It won't take you 30 minutes unless you slow down and go, I don't know what that means, which that's going to happen here tonight. So hang on. Let's cover the two points for tonight we talked about, the confidence in prayer, and your second one will be confidence in knowing and knowledge, but leave that out for a second. Confidence in prayer. Let me read uh, just 13 and 15 this way. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of Son of God, who represents all that Jesus Christ is and does, so that you will know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have 
and that we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that for a fact, that he hears us and listens to us, in whatever we ask, we know and have absolute knowledge that we have granted to us the request which we've asked, we've asked from him. Confidence should equal boldness. If, Larry, if you're confident, you're bold, aren't you? I didn't say cocky. Luke, you remember upstairs? I said something to him about confidence. Didn't I remember that? And, and I, I said something about being cocky. And, and Luke, I, I taught the youth for like 12 weeks. And, and you said, I'm not cocky. I'm just, I'm confident. You don't remember saying that even, do you? But we had a lot of good conversations. But it's the truth. Confidence is not cocky. Confidence is bold and confident. That's where the confidence words come from. It makes sense. And we should be confident when we pray. The key to getting your request is not begging and begging and begging and begging, although he tells us to do that. But the confidence that it's going to happen is that we're in total agreement with the will of God. That is confidence. Somewhat challenging. But he gives you the answers to how to do it and why it's to be done. It's because the more you pray in harmony with him and his thoughts and his beliefs and his word and everything you've ever heard him say from cover to cover. You know, in Baptist churches, we believe in Genesis to maps, right? Y'all got maps in yours? No, that's just what my mama used to say. But it's the whole Bible. And it's one letter, one love letter written in red ink, blood of Christ to us. So confidence. The confidence has to be in Him, not in us and what we can pull off today, what we can pray up today, what, what we can decide to do today or bust, Michael. It's got to be everything's in Him. See, that's what we talked about this morning a lot. It's funny because Michael and I had a good conversation this morning about this very thought. It's not about whether He can stir up some, some feel good today or stir up some confidence today. Because you have all the confidence you need in Christ. His confidence and our confidence in him is built on his promises. Favorite hymn of all time. Standing on the promises I cannot fail. Is that what it says, by the way? I hope. And sung it in a while. We can sing that on Sunday if you like. But, but, you know, how do you stand on something you don't know? If you don't know his promises, what chance do you have of standing upon them? Okay, y'all got that? Everybody got that? In accordance with him, in agreement with him, in consensus with God or, and God's will. How you want to be? You want to be in consensus with the church? This means we're all getting along and we're moving forward and we're blessing people and we're souls getting saved and people joining the church and everything's good. That's consensus and that's really hard to pull off, isn't it? But consensus with God. That's pretty cool. And that's when he hears you. You've got to be confident that he hears you because you're praying something he wants to hear. That's my, my professor's advice was pray scripture. If I pray scripture for Michael, for, for Carl, for Gary, then bound to happen, right? Now, I've got to put the right verse at the right time for the right need. I can't just pray what I want and claim a scripture to get it and Stick it aside. You know, that's going to happen, sure. It's not how it works, is it, Liz? That's not how it works at all. But if we have confidence that we're in total agreement with him and what he says, that verse in uh, the, this passage says it to it. If we pray anything according to his will, and his will means that is consistent with his plan and his purpose, he hears us. One quick thought on this, and we'll jump to the the harder verses of 16 and 17. The, the idea that we have to pray in accordance with his will sounds challenging. It sounds like a, a hill to climb, but it's not. It's just a gracious limitation that if we're praying in accordance with his will, does he promise us in another chapter in Matthew that he's going to give his children good gifts? Donnie, you know that passage? Good gifts? That's all he gives us. If we ask him for a, a, a piece of bread, is he going to give us a stone? 
You know, if we ask him for a fish, is he going to give us a scorpion or a serpent? No, that's not the God I love. Barbara knows better than that. Amen, amen. It's a gracious limitation that he will always give good gifts for his children. And the petition's granted. It means consistency with his plan and his purpose. Jump into verse 16 and 17, and we're going to do the second point. Confidence in knowledge or knowing. And I don't want you to have confidence that you've been to three and a half years of cemetery. I mean seminary. Um, that's, some people called it cemetery, some people call it seminary. Um, and Jeff's there now getting some more cemetery. You know, that's where he's at right now. But it's, it's not just knowledge you pack in your skull. It's back to the confidence again. And what do you know? You know him. It's that simple. It's never going to be easy. But it's simple. And not that it's so hard that you can't do it because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. Really, he can do all things through you while he's strengthening you. Does that sound better? Because I can do all things. This sounds so prideful, you know what I'm saying? I don't like that translation. But it's a, it's a translation, so leave it alone. Let's live alone. But it's just key to pray that way. Let's read 16 and 17. Let's jump right over there and get this thing finished. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, this is amplified. Listen to this. If anyone sees his brother, that's, that brother's a key phrase because that didn't means Christian. Committing a sin that does not lead to death, he will pray and ask on that believer's behalf, and God will give him life to those whose sin is not leading to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that you should pray for that sin or that kind of sin. It can be very complicated right there. All wrongdoing is sin. So he's not trying to say, this is this is this sin, and this is this sin. You pray for this one, you don't pray for that one. All sin is unrighteousness, and all unrighteousness is sin. Don't get hung up on the sin unto death part. I did for about a week and a half, and I got no progress, and I got nothing written down. I didn't know what to say next, and I was getting aggravated. And I just flipped into this translation, and then I looked at another commentary, and it kind of came to light. There's not a lot of consensus on, consensus, that word again, on what this truly means, except... God wants you to pray for everyone. But if somebody's habitually doing the wrong things over and over and over again, just pray for the person. Don't beat that sin to death. And if it's something leading unto death, that's God's call. You know, therefore, is no condemnation in Christ. And when it says we don't ever judge, that's not really the right. If you read on, it says we have no right to condemn others. We're going to judge each other, you know, and help each other and prop each other up and restore others like me and Michael restore each other. Carl restores me. You know, Gary and I correct one another. It's, it works that way. But don't get, don't get hung up on that portion of this passage. Get hung up on the fact that if you pray and it's not a sin leading unto death, which only God fleshes this out in a scenario that it's more about habitual sin. It's not about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because a believer can't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. So it just doesn't work. At least in English it doesn't. You need to focus on the fact that if you pray for them, God will give him life. Okay. Is that good? Clear as mud? Bottom line is all unrighteousness is sin. And y'all just pray for folks and never stop. And then do what Keith will do. Go snatch them out of the ditch and help them. <laughs> I wish he was here tonight. Okay. 16 and 17, short and sweet. I spent two weeks on it. I'm not going to go back there. 18, really good stuff. Now, here, here's the heavy knowing part. There's going to be no in this passage so many times, it's going to blow your mind. We know with confidence that any... Now, this sounds a little bit different. See, New King James, we know that anybody that's born of God does not sin. And we decided everybody probably sinned today. It's still, it's still early if you haven't. You know, I'll bust my chin against the chin against the doorknob coming in, or the cat's gonna scratch me, and Lee's not there to fix it, or the cat. It's me and a cat tonight. That's all I got. Probably gonna be some sinning going on. You know, <sighs> but it, it's it's my life. Sorry, right. <laughs> sorry. Don't tell her I did that, Donna. Don't do that. Listen to this. We know with confidence that anyone born of God does not habitually sin. See this? See it sounds a little different. But he, Jesus, who was born of God, carefully keeps and protects him, 
and the evil one does not touch him. Up here, you've got a keep there that's very important. And in verse 19, you got it again, so it changes. Mm, 20, 20 is where I'm at. Now, back to 18. There's an implication there in the King James that that keeping part, anybody born of God, well, God keeps himself, yes. There's two keeps mentioned in this passage. One is, is God keeping you from doing something, and another one is, we'll talk about Satan here in a second, where he can't touch you. And that touch isn't just touch like I'm touching Carl. Satan can't grasp you, hold you, fill you, control you if you're saved. Key, key to that scenario. Where did my passage go? There it is. We know with confidence that anyone born of God does not habitually sin, but he who was born of God keeps and protects him. God protects him. And the evil one cannot touch, grasp, hold, control him. We know for a fact that we are of God. And the whole world, this is better to me than that sway of, of scenario, that the world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Listen to this, what this says. We know for a fact that we are of God and the whole world around us lies in the power of the evil one who opposes God and his precepts, concepts, all of his steps. Don't put yourselves against people ever. I don't care if it's homosexuality. I don't care if it's child abuse. I don't care if it's a murderer. Y'all know that three murderers wrote most of the Bible, right? Moses killed the Egyptian. David committed adultery and killed the husband Uriah to put cover up with it. And Paul was holding the coats of the first deacon that died, Stephen. Y'all throw the rocks, I'll hold the coats. And those three men, Moses, David, and Paul, wrote most of our Bible. And God forgave them of murder. I hadn't killed anybody last week, y'all. Anybody? I know if you wanted to kill him in your heart, you've already done it, but it's not quite the same as blowing his head off. No offense. Sorry. That's just how I talk. Jeff worried about that a little bit. Nah, he didn't care. God's out there. You know that, that, that touching thing? Did you notice that Job got touched a little bit by Satan? A little bit is not really a fair statement. Read Job. Just two chapters. That's all it takes. Those first two chapters will show you how much he got touched. But he didn't get controlled. And he didn't sin. Just later on, he qu- that's another story. Another, another sermon. So, But God allowed that touching. Satan can't, if you're in a mess today, physically, spiritually, or otherwise... God's allowing it for some reason. Michael knows that leg's whooping him right now. I know, I know. Been there, done that. This is heavy right here, verse 20. And we have seen and know by personal experience that the Son of God has given us understanding and insight so that we may know him who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God in eternal life. You've heard Jeff Tech talk a ton about Gnosticism and how they're trying to deny the deity of Christ all through this book, or that's what they're trying to combat. And so this is the best statement in the whole book of Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God, Jesus is Christ. Sums it up. Last verse. Little children, believers, dear ones, guard yourselves from idols, false teachings, moral compromises, and anything that would take God's place in your heart. The King James says, keep yourselves from idols. It means build a garrison around yourself. Guard yourself in a way you've never guarded yourself against anything. Because what's worse? You saying something mean to somebody? Or are you picking something and putting it in the place of God? You slapping the fire out of somebody? Or just taking God out of the picture? That's why he closes with this. All this knowledge and all this confidence and all this boldness we've talked about for the last 30 minutes, you put it all at question if you put something between you and God. And that's what an idol is. And that's what Ephesus was eaten up with. They were full of idols. And so that's why he says, oh, by the way, all the junk you see around you, 
Don't put it in your life. Get it out of your life. Don't let something come between you and God. Or your confidence, it won't, you don't lose it, but you think you lost it. You feel like you lost it. You feel lost. And what's the chance of you praying somebody else into a good place, like in verse 18, if you have no confidence in your prayer? If you don't know that you know that you know him? No times for questions. If you got a question, write it down. Hand it to me or come up afterwards. I'll be here for five minutes while he's uh, trying to run us off and have some car practice. Can I close this with prayer? Father God, thank you for helping me land the plane. Forgive me for rambling around to get there. Thank you for your courage to hold us and keep us and never leave us. Thank you that you are a mighty refuge and ever-present help in times of trouble. Thank you that you are our source and our strength. You never, ever lose us. Thank you that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Height, depth, nor any other created thing shall separate us from the love of God. Thank you for those promises. Thank you today that help us to truly be anxious for nothing, but everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Give all our requests to you in prayer. Knowing you hear them, you're going to do what you want to do with them and to them and through us to help us do them. But so that peace of God that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you today for Hillwood Baptist Church. We'll talk to you later, Lord. Amen.